Mother's Gate family. Uh, it's great to be here filling in for Pastor Lee on a Sunday message. And you, my family, know that I'm often a little bit nervous when I speak in the sanctuary. Um, but I have to admit, this is a little more nerve-wracking. It's a new medium video. And so if I stumble or I hem and haw or I lose my train of thought, I'm going to be immortalized on YouTube. That nasty pandemic has really thrown us all for a loop, hasn't it? Um, and... But let's be truthful, even without the pandemic, life can throw us some curveballs, right? Uh, here in Hampton Roads, we're recovering from a tropical storm. And forgive me if I don't pronounce this right, I think it was a tropical storm, Isaias, or something like that. And, you know, there are still folks without power. I remember one time going through Sandbridge, driving uh, through after, I believe it was Hurricane Isabel, and coming across a house that was on the ocean front that was tilting over precariously. Um, and why is that? It's because we all know that builder built on uh, shifty sands and not a, a firm foundation. And we also know that what happens in real life can sometimes be a moving metaphor for what can happen in our spiritual lives. Because if we put our confidence in temporal things like buildings or jobs or, you know, even relationships, um, we can find ourselves tilting over precariously, perhaps poised to fall over in a sea of anguish. But we who are Christians have good news. We know that if we put our faith uh, in Jesus Christ, we're not going to be disappointed. We will be able to withstand the winds of devastating change, seemingly unendurable tragedy, and even the cruelty or betrayal of others. And actually, that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. And the, uh, what I'd like to study is an example of that, of, of uh, a relationship that devolved into cruelty and betrayal, and uh, it will probably come as no surprise to you that I'm going to look at King David and how um, Saul was relentless in his pursuit of David trying to uh, kill him, and unjust, very unjustified, we all know. So I'm going to start with by reading out of 1 Samuel 18.10, and in this um, um, uh, verse, we know that uh, David typically would play the harp for uh, Saul because that um, soothed Saul's troubled spirit. So keep that in mind. That's what David is doing in this particular incident. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had his spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Well, now besides being super quick, David had something else going for him. He had strength of character. He could have given in to the temptation to retaliate against Saul, but he didn't. Um, because he had grasped an important truth, and one that actually resonates throughout the Bible, um, in, particularly in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. And God did provide a way out for David. He did so in the form of Jonathan, the son of Saul the very man who was trying to kill David. So by now, you've probably guessed that my message is going to deal somewhat with um, building your life on a firm foundation, and it's true that I am going to touch on that, you know, tangentially. But I realize I'm talking largely to my church family, and you all have already built your lives on that firm foundation. So I'm going to take a little different tack today and encourage you who are already victorious to be Jonathans for those who are under pressure, who may be um, just ready to sink in the quicksand of some type of emotional or spiritual distress. Now, 
Granted, as I say this, I realize that I'm asking a lot. Because if you're going to be a Jonathan for someone, someone that is usually going to require you to put aside your own self-interest. And that's exactly what uh, Jonathan did. Um, let me read now, continuing with our study in 1 Samuel. I'm going to be reading uh, from uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Saul told his son and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I will speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. And Jonathan goes a step further. He doesn't just tell David he's with him. He tries to intervene and talk to his father. So in that same chapter, he says to his dad, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? And you may recall, at this point, um, Jonathan seems to have uh, convinced his dad not to do wrong against um, David. But the tragedy is Saul doesn't stay true to a promise he makes not to kill David. He tries again and again. And, but Jonathan, in contrast, stays true to his oath of friendship with David. Now think about how incredible that is for a minute. Uh, Jonathan was in line to inherit the throne after Saul. So in the natural order of things, Israelites probably would have understood it if he threw in with his father and um, took a stance against David. But Jonathan, unlike Saul, built his life on a firm foundation. He realized that if God was for David, who was he to be against him? And he uh, was such an active participant in his oath of friendship. He even stepped forward to offer encouragement and counsel in tough times. In 1 Samuel 23, verses 16 and 17, we hear this. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horeb and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And I would like to ask you, have you ever had a Jonathan in your life? And if you have, I would uh, hedge to guess that it was a transformative relationship. Um, I would like to tell you about a time, I've had, I've had, let me back up and say, I've had several Jonathans in my life. I've truly been blessed, but I'd like to share one with you uh, that happened actually quite a long time ago, but, you know, it's still very vivid in my memory. So, a long, um, many years ago, I worked in an office of um, public relations practitioners. It was a rather large office, and for um, uh, various reasons, we had our director up and quit. And um, the organization was not going to let the job be filled for quite a while, so they needed to put someone in the interim post. Now, one of my colleagues had been there for quite a while. She had an excellent reputation. She worked really hard, and we naturally thought she was going to be the one that was asked to step in um, the gap. But she wasn't. I was. Now, she could have gone to the bosses and said, listen, I've worked here longer than Kathy. I have a wonderful work record. Why would you, you know, put her in this position instead of me? But she didn't. Instead, she came to me and she humbly said, you have my full support. And she stayed true to that promise. She did everything in the months that I was in charge to make sure that I would shine in that uh, job. Now, granted, I wasn't under threat of death like David was, but uh, this could have been a career fiasco for me if things hadn't gone well. And 
And so to this day, I think that I owe her a debt of gratitude because I, my career had a positive trajectory from that uh, point and forward. She laid the groundwork for that. She was, in essence, my Jonathan. Now, my friend's sacrifice was similar to Jonathan's in the fact that what seemed to be rightfully hers was given to somebody else. But Jonathan put aside his own interest as well to give his loyalty to that someone else. Jonathan, the man who wouldn't be king, put aside his own interest to build his life on a firm foundation, not on the shifting sands of a kingdom, a castle, or a harem, or even the acclaim of others. And you know, I believe if Hollywood had written this story, uh, Jonathan would have been rewarded for his unselfish loyalty. Saul would have seen the error of his ways, and he would have given the keys of the kingdom over to David and Jonathan, and they would have uh, ruled in tandem over people who uh, were happy and grateful for that leadership. But God wrote this story, and happy endings aren't always his stock in trade. Instead, he puts in motion what is right, not what sounds good or looks good to man. But um, what was really sad, too, about this story is Jonathan is killed in a battle against the Phil Philistines, and in that very same battle, Saul takes his own life. So it looks like there isn't a happy ending. But remember, God's timing is not our timing. Now, for all of the all of us who are blessed to be parents, our children are what are dearest to us. Correct? So let's continue with the story with that thought in mind. Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan was only five years old when both his father and grandfather died in the battle of Mount Giloa. And now, after the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, um, Mephibosheth's nurse takes him and flees, and she either drops him or somehow he's injured and it, it cripples him in both feet. Now, uh, years, several years later, uh, David is looking for, uh, he actually uh, rises to the kingship, and he begins looking for someone from the house of Saul to whom he could show the kindness of God. And he explicitly says he wants to do that for Jonathan's sake. Now there's a servant of Saul's that I guess is, in da is now in David's employ, so he answers uh, David. He tells him there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. So King David had Mephibosheth brought to him. So at this point, let me read from that account, which is in 2 Samuel 9, verse 6. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth. Now let me pause here and say in that, that if you look in the Bible, there is an exclamation point behind that word, Mephibosheth. And I actually feel that I can hear the anguish and love in David's voice when he says that. Because in front of him is a, a, a young crippled man, and he is the son of a man that David loved dearly. Someone that had paid really the ultimate price to make sure that David was the king. So um, this young man, as we know, because he's crippled, really can't offer much to King David. And I imagine that as he's there, you know, in his audience with David, he's fearful because he knows that his grandfather was a vicious enemy of the king's. And I wonder if he was thinking, will the sins of my grandfather be visited upon me? So he answers the king, and I guess... I, I surmise that he's, he's got a tremulous voice when he answers. What he says after um, David says Mephibosheth, he says, your servant. But in verse 7, David rushes to reassure the young man. He tells Mephibosheth, do not be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you. All the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and 
you will always eat at my table. King David never let go of that promise. From what I understand, Mephibosheth from that point on always ate at the king's table. The young man who was crippled for life, who heretofore had to depend on the kindness of others for support, was now restored to riches in the good graces of the king. Not because he inherently deserved it, but because David stayed true to his covenant with Jonathan, because God, Jonathan stayed true to his covenant with David, and Jonathan was a man who gave it all up for what was good, right, true, and lovely in the eyes of, of God. And in the long run, don't you think that's what Jonathan would have wanted most of all? A good and decent life for his child. And isn't that really much better than a Hollywood ending in the long run? You know, I chose to speak of this story because it's always touched my heart. But even as I share it, I confess that I've never been a Jonathan. Oh, true, I've done nice things for people, but I don't think I've ever you know, done things that rise to the level of being a Jonathan in someone's life. So I really do aspire to be, and I pray that if God should ever open a door, that I'll walk through it. Because if I walk through it, I know it's going to ask a lot of me. But I also pray for, you, for that for you too. Now, perhaps you've had a Jonathan in your life, or even better, perhaps you've been a Jonathan for someone, and if so, thank God for those holy opportunities. But if, like me, you've not arrived at that point, but you want to be open to that future possibility, you just need to realize you are up for the task. You have already built your lives on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ's love for you. And if you're blessed to be a parent, what better model could you be for your children than to um, stand firm on a covenant, even if it calls for extreme sacrifice? God called you to be part of his family, so you have an important role to play in his kingdom. Walk through any door he opens for you, because while the ending might not be uh, worthy of a Hollywood movie, the long-term good can roll through the ages. And in the words of my son's generation, just how cool is that? Thank you so much, and may God richly bless each and every one of you.